Also, remember to hit the like button, subscribe, and share this video. Also, hit the bell, no bell icon for instant notifications for our next video. Now, let's get right into it. Hello, guys, and welcome to part 3 of IDCC Computer Science Chapter 8 Security and Ethics Authentication. So, authentication is used to verify if the data comes from a trusted source, as I've explained before. It's used to see if the data has come from a reputed source or a trusted source. Different types of authentication include passwords, digital signatures involving uh, keys. I mean, um, yeah, digital signatures. Basically, digital signatures involves if you're uh, involves checking your ha the hash of your uh, computer code uh, and seeing if it matches something on the database. The computer code can be anything basically uh, that can be used to verify your data. Then biometrics, which includes a retinal scan. Uh, fingerprint scanners and facial recognition, all of which are very good because um, they're all unique in different ways. Uh, a retinal scan, which is basically scanning uh, of your eyes, facial scan, your fingerprint uh, scanning. They're very trusted, they, they, are very, they are very useful because they're all unique. No two fingerprints are the same. No two retinal scans are the same. No two facial faces are the same, although some might be similar. So the, more, the best one here is the retinal scan because the retinal scan, uses infrared waves to basically uh, check the, your blood vessels be, um, behind your eye and it makes a pattern of that and it only uh, basically this method of authentication is used in such a way that it only accepts the pattern of your blood vessels of that person it won't accept anybody else and it's a this is very uh, the retinal scan why the retinal scan is best is the error chance, the chance of error is like one in 500 million or something because everybody has a very unique uh, retinal scan pattern. Digital signatures, it's based on public key encryption. It's again used to validate the authenticity of a message or electronic document. It's sort of like reversing asymmetric encryption, but also makes use of hashing. Thereby, it's basically hashing your data. Since your data all over the internet, and then uh, this important data that is, um, then a database will check this hash, see if it matches uh, the encrypted hash in their database. If it's uh, if it's uh, if it matches now, the data is authentic. Basically, this information can be anything um, such as user activity, your any sort of username you've entered, password, etc. This is an example of a digital signature. So you write a message, is put through the hashing algorithm. A private key, you then encrypt the hash. This is the digital signature. The message and the encrypted hash are sent to user B. So they're sending the message and the hash to version, the encrypted hash of the message. Uh, the user B decrypts the hash using the public key. And then the hash uh, number and the message are compared uh, to uh, check if the data has been altered. Passwords. Uh, along with usernames are used to log in to many systems. When a user logs into a system, both their username and password are entered and checked against the stores, uh, stored username and password on the database to make sure the person logging in is who they claim to be. Basically, as you all know, uh, when you enter passwords in your um, phone or your laptop, it's comparing your password to, uh, to the password that you have saved. Only if it matches, it allows you through because it's, it means it's you. If you've entered your password, it, the computer knows, oh, it's my user it, or somebody uh, the user knows or has stored the password to. So if anybody else doesn't know the password and they try to get on your computer, they can't get through because the computer knows, oh, this is the wrong password. I'm not letting you in because you're not a trusted person. If only the password that you've entered and the password in the database match, uh, the access is granted. If they don't, access is denied, as you know. Passwords stored on the database can also be hashed to increase security. So the password that you've stored in your computer's database can be hashed even more to increase security so that the, um, so the password sent when the user logs in is hashed. So basically, uh, when you type in your password in your computer, it will then be hashed and then compared with the hashed password that's from the database. So increase security so a person can't like break into your uh, PC and figure out your password for that.
Biometrics, as I've explained before, is a type of authentication that uses physical qualities uh, of humans involving fingerprint scans, retinal scans, facial scans. Oh, and something I forgot to mention, uh, voice recognition. Basically, you have to say a couple of phrases such as, hello, this is me, Sarvesh J. Kumar, or something like that. And the computer can recognize you because you said a similar or because you probably have to save a similar voice message in the computer already. So it will compare the two uh, waves, wavelength, sorry, the voice um, signals. Um, and if they're the same, access is granted. A DOS. A DOS attack is known as a denial of service attack, preventing users from accessing part of a network. This is usually temporary, but can be very damaging. So based in a nutshell, how uh, a DOS attack, uh, how a DOS attack works is, whenever you're logging into a website, you send a request to the website. So if you click a button such as uh, enter, like such as uh, save uh, this, uh, go to home page or something, you are basically sending a request to the web um, server. And the web server is like, okay, you want to go to the home page? Okay, go to the home page. And it, uh, and it makes the response for you. So you go to the home page. In such a way, how a DOS attack works is it uses a program to send many requests continuously, very useless um, requests basically, thereby flooding the network with useless traffic and information. So it keeps on telling the web server, okay, go there, go there, go there very quickly. Basically, this is all useless things and all this information is just too much for the web server to handle. And it makes the server very slow. And keep in mind, this was all a program. So if a real user wanted to click a home page, he can't do it because there are so many useless content uh, going to the web server that the real legitimate, the real uh, uh, a real request sent by a user can't be put through. It's like if you're in a restaurant and the waiter is getting so many um, request to go to their table and take that that customer's order and you try to call them the waiter won't notice you because he's been occupied by so many requests in a similar way so the effects of when uh, so many requests are sent uh, so many useless requests are sent to the network is whenever a user clicks or enters a link a request is sent to the uh, internet server as we've explained uh yes basically you can't do anything if everything is flooded with uh, with requests Whenever you try to set a legitimate request, a real request, you can't do it. It denies you. Because the network is very slow now and is preoccupied. Uh, the DOS attacks can happen to many things. For example, your email account, it will send many spam emails to your user's inbox. And your ISP, your internet service provider, can help you out in this by only allowing, uh, sorry, it can use a spam filter, which can help in some things. Again, coming to the ISP, the ISP only allow a certain amount of data for each user. So it only allows like 50 or 1 GB or 2 GB, depending on the plan you've subscribed by. So by filling your user's input with so many spam messages, the user won't be able to get legitimate images, uh, emails. Sorry. So if you get so many spam messages, you'll just see, oh, you get one crore if you click this link, that link. And if a person really sends you a trustworthy link, like a bank, for example, you won't be able to receive it because it's just flooded with all these useless things and your data might um, be dep uh, depleted because of all these useless spam messages that are being loaded up with your mobile data or your Wi-Fi, etc. Methods to avoid slash prevent a, a DOS attack. You have to use an up-to-date malware and virus checker which can figure out these kind of uh, looping programs and delete them. You have to use a firewall to restrict uh, and uh, the user's comments. Sorry. Hmm. Yeah, you have to use a uh, firewall to restrict data to and for the user's computer and the internet server. Uh, you can use an email filter to filter out unwanted traffic or spam emails, basically acting as the thing I, which I've explained that the ISP provides earlier. Uh, how to identify a DOS attack is you have to look for the slow performance uh, of websites when you try to access them. And you have to look out for the unavailability or inability to access certain websites. So if websites are very slow and you can't access them, it's most likely that they're under a DOS attack and it's better for you to leave the website. That is. Next, computer ethics. So computer ethics are a set of laws set by certain companies such as the IEEE. Uh, that regulate the use of computers. 
So basically, it's how you should act when using a computer connected to the internet. So there covers three proper, uh, three points, sorry. Intellectual property rights, privacy issues, and impact of computers on society. Use of internet has increased plagiarism, which is basically copying somebody else's idea or work and saying, uh, and claiming it as your own. Basically, uh, somebody else has drawn a picture, and then you've drawn the same picture and said, I have drawn this picture first. That is an example of plagiarism. Quoting a person's idea is fine. Basically saying, okay, uh, I've got this data from this website and this is the author. Quoting them, saying who the real author is, is fine. But if you try to, um, uh, if you try to say that it's yours, that's the wrong thing. So you have to acknowledge the, uh, the originator of the idea. Basically, um, you have to tell that, okay, this person made it and it's not me. Uh, this kind of referencing is, I mean, this kind of acknowledgement is usually done by referencing sources of information at the end of a document. So at the end of the document, you can say, okay, I have obtained this data from www.wikipedia.com or some www.wikihow.com or something in order to uh, reference us, acknowledge the real um, originator of the idea in case it's, if it's not yours. Freeware, free software and shareware. Free software is a type of software where, I mean, it's, it's a type of software license where the users have the right to run, copy, or adapt free software. The user is guaranteed the freedom to study and modify the source code of the software, basically the main code that makes up the software. Uh, they're also allowed to pass the modified or unmodified source code onto others. So basically, you can do anything to the software and send it to other people. Free software, uh, in free software, users are not allowed to add source code from source software which isn't described as free software, for the free software that is. So some software might be protected by copyright laws and you can't take data from this and put it in your edited free software because that infringes copyright laws. Basically, you're breaking the law and people can find you for that and sue you for that. Next, um, your users are not allowed to produce software that uh, ex um, uh, that imitates slash copies existing software that has copyright protection. So don't make a software that copies another software that has copyright because again, same issue. Uh, you're not allowed to adapt software that it, uh, that it infringes copyright, so that it infringes copyright laws that protect other softwares. Again, you're not allowed to um, modify your software in such a way that it breaks copyright laws by copying another software, which again, might have copyright on it. Uh, and then you're not allowed to use the source code to produce some sort of uh, software which is deemed offensive by third parties. So you cannot make a, a website that infringes certain laws or regulations. For example, you can't make a website that promotes some sort of terrorist organization because that will be taken down in the internet. Next, freeware. It's very similar to free software. Um, it can be downloaded free off the internet. However, it has copyright laws. You cannot copy it and claim it as your own because you will be sued. Shareware is basically, uh, users are allowed to type this type of shareware for a uh, software, sorry, for a free, uh, for free for a period of time. So basically it's a trial package of a software. So for example, if you use Word, you get a trial package for two to three days. At the end of this trial period, the user must pay a fee to continue using it. Basically after the trial ends, you have to pay the money if you want to continue using it. If you're happy with the software, you can pay money and own it. Then you'll own it. Once you pay this fee, the user is registered with the software originally. Yes. So you made an, after paying the fee, you've made like an account with the software and you're a registered person. You're using it legally and you're offered updates and support basically to help you out with the software because you own it now and you've paid good money for it. In many cases, the trial version for the software is missing the features for the full version. Obviously, because if a paid program and they're giving it to, uh, to you for free. They're going to withhold some stuff. They're not going to give everything for free. That's why you need to buy the software. It's basically a type of promotion, basically. This type of shareware, again, is protected by copyright laws. So you cannot use the source code in any of your own software. You can't copy it. Uh, even if you reference the author or acknowledge the author in this situation, it won't help you out because you strictly can't use it. Well, you may, you can if you have explicit permission, but in most cases, you can't copy it out. 
And that's the end of the uh, security and ethics chapter eight of Computer Science. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned on Code4 for more videos.